Well, hello, everyone. I don't know who that person was who was introduced, but she sounds super fancy. Um, it's great to be here with all of you, people who are out there in the trenches every day trying to make change in the world. And I feel really blessed to be on the stage with people like Representative Jayapal, who I worked alongside to help pass what was called Build Back Better and the Inflation Reduction Act, and is really the kind of leader that we need more of in this country. So, you know, you may have thought about climate change. I'm just gonna guess that you have. And sometimes when you do that, people ask you this question, what can I do about climate change? Maybe you've asked yourself that question. Maybe you asked yourself that question today. And the answers often come in the form of this, right? The carbon footprint. What can I do? I can plant trees. I can drive less. I can eat less meat. Reuse water, don't use plastic. And just to be clear, I support all these things, I do all these things. But it also probably leaves us with a sense that that's not enough, or that that's not really the nature of the problem. And so what I'm gonna talk about today is this. You might have gone a little further into this what can I do question, learn more about climate change, and what you might have discovered is that carbon pollution, greenhouse gas pollution, comes from lots of different parts of the economy, and it comes in a lot of different forms, right? So yes, there is our old friend, carbon dioxide, which we're breathing out of our own bodies every moment. But then there's also these other weird things like methane, nitrous oxide, HFCs, super pollutants, right? And so we think, oh gosh, there's so many different chemicals that I have to get on top of. And then we start learning about the different sectors of the economy, right? We learn about the electricity sector, which I decided to spend my life doing, thinking it was a remarkably boring topic that no one would care about, and then discovering that people did care about it, which is nice, because it's rather important, actually, from a greenhouse gas pollution perspective. Or maybe you've decided to go deep on transportation, you're passionate about biking or public transit. Maybe you've discovered there's this giant pink part of the economy called industry that is a huge chunk of the pollution problem and rather difficult to clean up. Or maybe you're excited about agriculture, I'm sure many people here are, or buildings, right? So you start to think, oh my gosh, there's so many different pollutants and there's so many different parts of the economy that we have to clean up, I am overwhelmed. I'm gonna simplify that for you. I'm gonna tell you that we really just need two things to clean up about three quarters of carbon pollution. And this isn't a magic trick. It's something that probably took me, I don't know, 14 years to figure out on my own climate journey. But the two big things are clean electricity and electrification. Now, they do not solve all the problems, but they solve about three quarters of the current problem. How does that work? Well, first, we clean up the power sector we get to 100% clean power. And then we use that clean power to power our cars, even our bicycles, our homes, parts of heavy industry. And that cleans up another half of the problem. So electrification plus clean electricity is 75% of the climate solution. Now, it's not everything. You may notice agriculture is not really in there. Parts of heavy industry require more than this. So I haven't given you 100% of the answer, but I've given you 75%. And I've given it to you in a relatively simple mental model that you can take forward into your daily life to make changes that are structural, that actually attack the heart of the fossil fuel industry. So what I want you to think about is everywhere you burn fossil fuels, like in a car, in the stove, in your house, in the hot water tank, in the furnace. Everywhere you're burning something, you're seeing a blue flame, turn that into electricity. Turn that into clean power. And that is a pathway out of this destructive fossil fuel industry into a future of sort of abundance. So the first step, oh, we're feeling excited about abundance, nice. Me too. Yeah, and it's, it's also a counter-narrative to what is so often told about our movement, that our movement is about scarcity, that my solution is for you to sit alone in your house in a big sweater, I don't know what, not eating, don't eat anymore. 
It's not my solution for you, okay? Just to be clear. So what is step one? Step one is 100% clean electricity and we got a bit of a timetable on here. I'm not going to be too specific. I'm going to say ASAP. That's when we have to do that. So what do we mean by clean electricity? Now this can get a little controversial, so let's break it down. Of course, there's the stuff that pretty much everybody is for. Even Republicans actually like this stuff, turns out. Republicans put solar on their roof as frequently as Democrats. Did you know that? Research by my colleagues at UC Santa Barbara have shown that. Wind energy, generally fairly popular. So those are things that we know are renewable energy sources. There's other sources that we could put in the middle there that are going to be less part of the transition, but are still part of the picture. Those are hydroelectricity. Now, the thing is, we've already developed most hydropower sources in this country. Hydropower supplies about 10% of our power, a little bit less. And at the most, we could expand that by 50%. So we could go from like 10, it's not really 10. We could go from, you know, it is from like 10 to 15, okay? So there's a hard cap on that. And of course, many people have concerns about expanding hydropower because it's effect on fish, for example. So, you know, hydropower is likely to be a limited resource to the size that we already have it today. There are other things like geothermal. Geothermal is another resource that we could use more of, but it's also limited. It has to be done in specific geographic areas. So although Iceland can run a lot of itself off of geothermal, and even parts of Hawaii can, it's not as easy to do that everywhere in the United States. There are other things like wave and tidal energy that have some challenges because just as a sort of easy way to think about it, the more you move stuff, the more it breaks. You may notice bicycle breaks sometimes. So do those technologies. And then at the bottom, we have two technologies that are a lot more controversial that have more side effects associated with them, but that are currently part of our energy mix or are likely to become more part of it. One is, of course, nuclear energy. I'm sure there are people here who don't support nuclear energy, and that is valid if you feel that way. I myself did not support nuclear energy, but I had a change of heart when I realized that it is carbon-free power and that if we shut it down currently, it will be replaced by fossil fuels. So there are hard choices. See, I'm saying that if you don't agree with me, that's a valid thing. You may have recalled I literally said that. So. That's valid. It's okay to have disagreements in democracy. We don't all have to agree with one another. And I said that I myself shared your opinion. And I myself ha had different opinions. And that is okay. It's okay to have different opinions from one another. Okay. <laughs> There's also hydrogen, which is another really thorny problem that's coming for us. So get excited for all the joyous challenges of the clean electricity transition. The point is that right now, 60% of our electricity system is made from fossil fuels. 40% is made from sources that don't emit carbon. What we have to do is get to 100% clean power. And it's valid, like I said, if you don't like the orange slice, your anti-orange slice, that's okay. But what you'll have to do is figure out how you're gonna get rid of the orange slice and the, the dirty coal and gas ones too. And that is a big challenge, right? And I think in the long run, that is what we're going to do, absolutely. But we've certainly seen moments where when we shut down a plant, for example, like Indian Point in uh, New York, that additional gas was burned in communities of color in New York City. And that that has impacts on, for example, young kids, like I literally have a black nephew growing up in New York City who is probably breathing dirtier air because of that. That's not a speculation, that's just reality. So we have to make tough, difficult choices in the clean energy transition. Now, the point is that we're about here in where clean power, we gotta get really far, really fast. And you may notice that I wrote 150% there. Why? Because not only do we have to clean up the energy system at the size that it is today, we have to go farther because all that new clean power is going to be necessary for electrification. So what is step two? Step two is electrify everything we can. And I put the we can there because sometimes people will say, but you can't electrify everything. And so yes, fair enough. We will do everything we can. <laughs> so right now, you may not realize it, but there are people in this room running fossil fuel power plants. 
What? I was a fossil fuel power plant operator as recently as three months ago because I had a gas stove, a furnace, a gas furnace, and a gas water tank. It was hanging out in my house, unbeknownst to me. Well, it was actually beknownst to me, but maybe it's unbeknownst to you. And so you may not realize it, but you're operating a fossil fuel power plant. Now, guess what? You don't have to. You can change those machines out. And that is a big activity that I want to challenge all of us to take on because there are now induction stoves, there are heat pumps, there are heat pump hot water heaters. And if we can turn those into electric machines, we can use, for example, the solar panels on our roof if we're lucky enough to have them or if our neighbors have solar panels to power those machines. So think about those machines in a different way. And you've probably heard in the last few months that operating those machines also has pretty bad health impacts on you and your loved ones in your home. Because we're burning something, right? You guys notice that when you burn stuff, it makes pollution? Particulate matter, nitrous oxides, etc. And it turns out that, for example, operating a gas stove is like having your friend come over and smoke in your living room. Would that be super polite in 2023 to go to your friend's house and just whip out a cigarette? No. Did we used to do that back in the day? Yes. Did we decide that maybe we're not going to do that anymore? Yes. So that's the same thing we're going to do with our gas stoves. Right. Yeah, nice. Right. I'm going to get rid of my gas stove. You do it, sister. I like it. Um, and the thing is, during COVID, many of us became more aware about indoor air quality. Some people got an indoor air quality monitor. Who got that? Who's the nerds in the room looking at numbers in their house? I want to challenge you to go cook a dinner on your gas stove and just see what happens. You don't need to read the peer-reviewed scientific literature. You can just look at numbers on your own monitor and discover that particulate matter and nitrous oxides or vox, um, are going through the roof. And I did that myself, and I decided to change to an induction stove. Now, the interesting thing is that it's not just our houses. These are all across our society. And I work at an organization called Rewiring America that is focused on electrifying the United States. And uh, we have been blessed by two folks named Saul Griffith and Sam Kalish, uh, who decided to count all the machines in the country that run on fossil fuels. Turns out it's a very difficult task, um, but there's a lot of them. So there's about 120 million of these gas stove-like things, including ovens and grills. There's 117 million uh, gas furnaces. There are 20 million gas dryers, 120 million gas water heaters. Uh, of course, there's all these cars uh, that also run on fossil fuels. And then there's these power plants as well. And it's interesting because there's also 200 newly proposed gas power plants right now that we have to figure out how to stop. So there's a lot of machines to do. And when you count them all up, the other thing you want to think about is how long do these machines last? If your gas water heater dies, as one of my friends did two days ago, he wrote to me. This is what happens now. It's a bit of a tragedy, I suppose. Um, Leah, my gas hot water tank broke. What should I do? <laughs> I said, okay, I got it for you, okay? There's a new, that Ream makes a new heat pump hot water tank that you can just plug into the wall, blah, 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 et cetera. So he wrote to me today, this morning, he said, I did it, I bought the heat pump hot water tank. I was like, yes, I've converted one machine. Very exciting, I had to do slightly more than that. But that's the kind of thing we have to think about. When a machine dies, we must replace it with an electric alternative. Yes. Yes, exactly, because what happens if we don't? If we don't, that water heater is going to belch out pollution for about another decade. If we build those 200 gas plants, they're going to belch out pollution for 30 to 60 more years. What was that plan that we had to stop putting out pollution in 2050? And how many years from now is 2050? Like 17? So wait a second, how is that going to work? How is it going to work if we keep putting in more fossil fuel appliances that last longer than the time period of our goals, it's not going to work. We have to make every new machine electric. And when you think about it, 
When you add up all those numbers, it turns out there are one billion machines in the United States alone that run on fossil fuels. That's overwhelming, but it's also an opportunity. Because when we ask the question of what can I do, are there one billion Americans? No, there are not. It means that every single person in this room, every single person in this country can electrify a couple machines. And that is a really important infrastructure change that we can make to stop using fossil fuels. I want to tell you some good news so you don't feel sad, slash I generally feel optimistic about the future. Um, guess what? Heat pumps outsold gas furnaces for the first time last year. Isn't that exciting? <laughs> so we are at an inflection point. Heat pumps are not just better, they are going to be cheaper to operate in most parts of the country, especially for people who are literally using oil or propane to heat their homes. And there's like 20 million American households who are doing that, for example. But even many folks on gas or on older versions of electric machines that use a lot of electricity. And where are we at in terms of the stock flow problem? Well, here we go. We've got about, mm, I don't know, maybe 20% or man, it's probably less, 10, 15% of the furnace problem done. The water heater problem, ooh, is a bad one. This is why I was so excited that this morning I converted one water heater to a heat pump because they basically don't exist, but they will soon. And I have one myself. Cooking, we're actually doing great on cooking. The interesting thing about the gas wars is that it's mostly people in California and New York who are cooking on gas stoves. So all these Democrats, they're gonna have to notice that they're polluting their own children and stop doing that. <laughs> and then we have cars. Electric vehicles are actually 25% of new sales as of last quarter in California. So we are starting to really make progress there. Yeah. And when we think about our 2050 goals and when we take them actually seriously, what we have to notice is that there's a stock flow problem here, right? We have to be getting to a point where 100% of new sales are, ga are electric appliances this decade. And it's really exciting because the Bay Area Air Quality District just voted to do that. So first in the country, good job, Bay Area. And Governor Newsom has actually been a massively leading governor who's been saying that he's going to stop these sort of um, gas sales in this state as well. Wow. The cool thing I'll tell you is that electric machines get cleaner every year. They are as clean as the electricity system is the day that they get put in, but guess what's going to happen? We're going to get to 100% clean power, and guess what's going to do to your machine? not going to have any pollution associated with it. So they get cleaner every year. That will never happen. I don't care how efficient your gas furnace is, it will never be as clean as a heat pump. If you'd like to know how to do this yourself, I recommend you go to rewiringamerica.org. We have a calculator that helps you figure out how much money you can get from the Inflation Reduction Act. This summer, we're going to be launching an even more tailored tool that can help you look at your specific house, your specific machines, connect you with contractors, and make it easier to do. I'll just say that I know not everybody owns a home, but maybe you can lobby someone who does, first of all, I support that. And many people have sent me pictures like this who are renters. And I did this too for a while, just to be clear. You get an induction cooktop, costs like 40 bucks. You get an electric um, oven, you stick it on top of your gas stove, you've electrified. <laughs> so I just want to leave you with this thought that when people ask you, what can I do about climate change? Or when you ask yourself, what can you do about climate change? I want you to think about electrification because this is really about getting fossil fuels out of your life. And it is not a repeated behavior. It's a one-time infrastructure change. If you electrify your house and you sell it, guess what? The next person lives in an electric home too. So thank you so much for hosting me today. It's been wonderful to meet all of you, and I hope that you go out and electrify your lives and make all the change possible that you can.